Well, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Yes, the Saturday night crowd. Everyone's still awake. That's awesome. It's better than Sunday morning, right? <laughs> Careful. Okay. <laughs> Man, we're so glad you guys are here this morning. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to, oh, this morning, this evening. <laughs> it's going to be a rough one. All right. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. And uh, Easter Sunday is uh, one of those Sundays where uh, any other Sunday, who knows? You know, it's I'm in the middle of teaching verse by verse through the Bible, and it's probably going to take me 15 years to get through the whole Bible. And so any given Sunday, have churches around the world be preaching on anything, any part of the Bible. You have no clue. But on this weekend, every church in the world is preaching on the same passage of Scripture, and how cool is that? Because the body of Christ comes together to celebrate one thing, that Jesus is alive. And it's interesting because people that don't go to church normally but will come on Christmas or Easter, they understand the fact that there's two big deals. Easter is a big deal because Jesus is alive. I need to get to church. Jesus is alive. You know, or Christmas. I need to get to church at Christmas because, you know, Jesus came. You know, he, he, he came for us. And so there, it's a big deal. But sometimes it's... Um, it's interesting because I purposely did not look at my sermon notes from last year because it's like, how, how do you not just preach the same sermon from last year? You know, like it's the same topic. So I purposely didn't look at that. And so today I want to look at a few things, but we're going to celebrate today that Jesus is alive. And so did you guys turn there in Luke chapter 24, verse 1? Okay. Everybody there? Okay. All right. Verse 1. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the man asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Isn't that awesome? Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this for tonight, God. We thank you for the chance to dive into your word. Father, we thank you that your word is powerful and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so tonight as we dive into your word, I pray that you, you would become that, that alive to those that, that, that have seek, seeked after you, that need you, that you'd become very real and very alive to them tonight as we dive into your word. So speak to us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the title of my sermon tonight is, Why Are You Looking Among the Dead for Someone Who Is Alive? You know, um, we live in a world where everyone's searching for an answer. And the world wants to tell you that it has the answer. But I want to tell you tonight, why are you looking among the dead for what is alive? You know, it's interesting because the world will try to counterfeit. The world will say, this is, this is the truth. This is the new truth. But it's interesting that in a world where all of a sudden there's more and more new truths, that anxiety gets higher and suicide gets higher and confusion gets higher. And the answer is, why are you looking among the dead for what's alive? And so tonight, I want to look at a few things because the world will say this is truth, but I want to tell you that the truth doesn't change. The truth doesn't change. Jesus was alive last Easter. He's alive this Easter, and I'm going to give you a heads up for next year. He's alive next year, too. I know. I just spoiled it for everybody. Hopefully, you still come next year. Doesn't change. The truth doesn't change, but people do. And so tonight, I want to maybe take a different look at this passage of Scripture tonight because I kind of want to look at the people around Jesus. Because Jesus is very much alive, but there were but people change, and there were different kinds of people. I want to look at those tonight. And so in John 18, it's on the, the screen, John 18, verse 19, it says, uh, Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he had been teaching them. 
Jesus replied, everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and the temples where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard me. They know what I said. Then one of the temple guards standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way to answer the high priest? He demanded. I kind of love this passage because this guy has no clue that Jesus is the high priest. Can you imagine that day when he stood before the throne and is like, oh, that's the guy slapped in the face. Can you imagine that? See, the thing was is that the Jews wanted a Messiah to save them from Rome, but they did not want a Messiah to save them from their sin. Well, that's not how, that's not how I want Jesus to be. And so people all the time will say, well, you know, if Jesus would be this, th th then I'd accept Jesus. We, 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 want, want, we want Jesus to fit our lives instead of changing our lives to fit Jesus. And so they rejected Jesus because they, he didn't fit the life they wanted to have. Things haven't changed too much. And so the answer you're looking for will not be found among the dead. And the question for you tonight is who will you be? So person number one tonight, we're going to look at four different people tonight. Person number one, the person who rejects Jesus because he isn't who they want him to be. I don't need this. Why can't I live my life the way I want it? If God is love, then I can do whatever I want. I'm not going to change anything. And what we really do is we slap Jesus in the face. How dare you interfere with my life and tell me I have to change anything in my life? And we don't realize we're trying to make Jesus alive in a world that is dead. And it doesn't work that way. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? See, you want Jesus to be all of these things. We want Jesus to celebrate our sin. But you won't find the one who's living among the dead. You won't. Yeah, but I'm a good person. You won't find the one who's living among the dead. And so let's take a look at John chapter 20. In verse 24, it says, One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it. Unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. See, Thomas was a person that spent time with Jesus. He saw all the things he could do. He saw the miracles. He saw everything. He saw everything that, that Jesus could do. But all of a sudden, his Messiah, his Savior, was, was, was brutally murdered. And all of a sudden, his faith was shaken. He said, I don't believe it. There's no way. I'll believe it when I see it. And tonight, maybe that's you. Maybe your faith has been shaken. You believe in, you believe in God. And people ask the question all the time, why would, why would God let this happen? Your faith is shaken. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. See, seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. If seeing was believing, then what is there really to believe? It, what's right there? Well, if God was real, why wouldn't he just make himself known? Has your faith been shaken? In Ephesians 1, 17, it says this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. 
the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, that are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what exceedingly greatness of his power towards us who believe. Towards who? Those who believe, right? Those who see. His great power to those who see. No, that's not what it says. It says those who believe. See, has your faith been shaken? Has your circumstances happened that have caused you to doubt things in your life that, man, I, I, I just struggle because things have happened to me that are so bad, how could God possibly be real? And now all of a sudden our faith is shaken. See, Thomas, the Savior and Messiah was murdered, and he couldn't believe it. He couldn't do it. I just, how could he be alive? There's no way. Will you be person number two, the person whose faith has been shaken, the person who doubts Jesus is really alive? The person who doubts that God desires to have a relationship with you, that God desires to have a, a that, that has a future and a plan for you, that God desires to, to forgive you for everything and say, hey, I've called you out of darkness to be in the light. Just leave that behind. Let's go. Is your faith shaken to where you say, I, 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 how could that be? See, luckily for him, he ended up getting to put his hands in the nail holes in Jesus' hands. He got to do that. In Mark 14, verse 3, it says, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, can you imagine being known for that? As he sat at the table, a woman having an alabaster flask of costly oil of spikenard, Sounds wonderful. Spike Nard. Then he spoke, and then he, she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why is this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. See, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus is there. And, and, and this this woman, she she pours this costly oil. That this oil is believed to have been about a year's wages. So I don't know what the average wage in America is right now, but in two thousand and one, it was sixty nine thousand dollars a year, just shy of seventy thousand dollars. And this woman basically takes seventy grand. Pours it over Jesus. And people get upset about it. This jar was like a solid jar. It wasn't like a twist top. It wasn't a spray. No, it was like a solid jar. And you saved it for that one special moment. And when that one special moment had come, you'd break the, the top of this jar off and you'd be able to use it, but you couldn't seal it back up. It was something that most women had saved for their wedding, and they kept it on this high shelf. Saving it for that special moment. In John 12, it says, Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made of the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance. So here in John 12, it says that this woman's name is Mary. And it's believed that this uh, Mary is Mary Magdalene. Um, there's no way to know for sure but because Mary was a common name. But they believe it to be her because she was everywhere. She was at his crucifixion. She was at the resurrection. Like her name is actually mentioned more times in the Bible than most of the disciples. And we're going to see why here in a second. So it says, oh, well, let's, so, so you've got this, this woman, and she, she takes this expensive thing that's saved for a special occasion, 
And she says, she takes it off of her shelf. And she says, the time is now. The special occasion is now. Jesus is here. I'm going to take the thing that I've been saving my whole life. And I'm going to use it right now. That's what I'm going to do. See, will you be person number three? The person who doesn't wait, but gives Jesus everything they have. You can have it all. I'm all in. I want Jesus. I'm not going to look for life among the dead anymore. I'm not going to continue to see what else is out there. Jesus, you can have my all. And so in Mark 14, it says this. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always, and she has done what she could. She, she uh, has come before hand to anoint my body for burial. Pay attention to that phrase. She's come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Surely I say to you, whatever this gospel, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, that what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And 2,000 years later, it's in my sermon. This is why her name is mentioned more times than most of the disciples. She gave everything she had. Why? Because she seized the moment. And Jesus predicts his death. So she takes the oil off her shelf. She says, I'm running out of time. If he's predicting his death, I'm running out of time. The time is now. And so she takes it off the shelf and she uses it now. In Matthew 28.1, it says, Now after the Sabbath... As the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. So now we get back to the first verse, and she's there at that moment, too. In Luke 24, 1, it says, But very early that Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and so in this, in, in Luke, it, it talks about a group of women that were going to anoint his body. We're going to go wash his body for burial. And so I like Matthew 28 because it mentions her by name. Now, this isn't in the passage of Scripture, but it's just how I imagine it to be. So this is the Isaac version of the, the passage of Scripture, okay? <clears throat> this is how I imagine it to be. You can see it now. All the women, they go and they take their spices and they're going to go and they're going to wash Jesus' body. And Mary Magdalene is there too. Why is she there? She already wasted hers. You know how much money that was? She wasted, like, I can't believe she did that. So the walking to the tomb and, I, and I, I just picture it. Again, it's not in the, in the scripture. I'm just telling you how I picture the story. This is a walk into the tomb, and she's got nothing left to give. She's like, I got nothing left to give. And all the other women are like, they got all their stuff. They're ready to go. They're carrying it. They're going to go wash Jesus' body. Man, I don't even know why she's there. You, you, you wasted yours. And then in Luke 24, verse 2, they found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. And the, woman, the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? In Matthew 28, it says, The angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. The trip back had to have been different from the trip there. 
Why is she with us? She wasted hers. She has nothing left to give. On the way back, Mary Magdalene's like, I got nothing left to give. Woo! You wasted your chance. He's gone. He ain't there anymore. You better go put your spike nerd back on the shelf. My shelf is empty. I gave everything. Can you imagine? Like, like the difference from the way there to the way back? Like, whoo! Oh! Like, this is amazing! See, the other women were too late. They never got to give everything to Jesus. They waited too long. See, will you be person number four? The person who waits too long to surrender everything they have to Jesus. I got plenty of time. No, you don't. This is uh, one time I had um, had these... uh, my, well, my first of all, my parents were missionaries, right? So we, we had no money at all. And one year for Christmas, I put on my list, I wanted Reebok pumps, okay? Now, they're not like the ones, hold, hold up, they're not like the ones we have today where it, like, just pumps the tongue up. No, no, no. The, back in the 80s, literally, the Reebok pumps literally, like, pumped up the whole shoe. You didn't even tie your shoelaces because you just went, pew, 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 pew. And nothing wasn't coming off. It was awesome. And then when you need to take your shoe off, they had a little button. It was like, pew. Well, you just sit there all day. And I remember because my parents didn't have money to buy me these shoes. Anybody else have those shoes? Just me. I'm the only cool one in the room. That's the first time ever. And my parents, they didn't have money to buy these shoes. And I felt guilty that I actually got them for Christmas. And I didn't want to mess the shoes up. So I kept them in the shoe box they came in. And every once in a while, I'd wear them around the house. But I didn't want to mess up these really expensive shoes. One day, I went to put the shoes on, and they didn't fit anymore. I waited too long because I left them on the shelf. See, what is the reason why why we won't surrender to the fact that Jesus is alive? Does he not fit the way you want it to be? Maybe the way you want it to be is wrong. Has your faith been shaking because something bad happened to you? Or are you just waiting for a better time? I'm going to leave it on the shelf for now. And so in Matthew 28, it says... And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to bring his disciples word. Can you imagine how fast they were running? Go! We're going to see Jesus run! Go, 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 go! See, some of us are ashamed to run in public. Anybody? Just me? When you're at the airport and you're a full-grown adult and you know you're late and you're like, this, I look so dumb, and you're like running through the air. Just me? I'm the only one that can't run, apparently. You get to your gate and you're like, 
and you're like, like you're dripping with sweat, and you're like, this is so embarrassing. I feel bad for the person who has to sit next to me. Man, they must have ran. I don't care what anybody thinks. I am running to Jesus. Go, 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 go. I want to challenge you tonight to run your race for him. It's time to move because we're going to see him. Don't be person number four. I think, I think I'm just going to wait. I got time. I want to tell you something that's been weighing heavy on my heart. When I was sick a couple weeks ago, I just laid in bed and, and I, I was stuck on one verse in the Bible. One. And it was this. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches are ready to become tender and it puts forth leaves, you will know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you will know that it is near at the doors. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Jesus is talking about end times. And the disciples thought, oh man, like we're, they're waiting for Jesus to come back. They thought he meant their generation won't pass away. But I want to tell you something that the fig tree in the Old Testament always represents Israel. Always. So when Israel becomes tender and puts forth leaves, when life begins to spring forth in Israel, when they appear to be dead and come back to life, see, Israel was all no more until 1948, and Israel became a nation, and they began to spring forth. I want to tell you right now that that generation is 75 years old. Everything in me believes that that generation will not pass away. I want to tell you tonight, I would not leave everything you have on the shelf any longer. I would not. I would not. If anything, listen to this. If anything, play the odds. Adam to Abraham's promise, 2,000 years. Abraham's promise to Jesus, 2,000 years. Jesus to now, 2,000 years. It would be odd for God to be like, I'm going to do nothing this time. At least play the odds. What, what is the reason why we've left everything on the shelf? I'm not going to choose Jesus today. No, I'm not going to do it. Why? He doesn't fit your life? Your faith has been shaken. That bad stuff has happened to me. I just don't know. You just think I got plenty of time. I challenge you for you tonight is be Mary Magdalene. Ha! <laughs> I got nothing left to give. Just you better go put your stuff back on the shelf. I gave Jesus my all. Are you willing to give Jesus your all? Come on. Easter is not just this day of the year where people randomly go to church they randomly go to church because they're going to hear the truth that he's alive and you won't find among the dead what is living today is your day today is your day because it is a simple decision that says Jesus You can have my all. I don't want what is dead anymore. I want what is alive. We 
run your race because we're going to see him and we're running out of time we're going to sing a song one more time if you guys will stand with me tonight see we like to at church it all starts with a decision and I tell people all the time you know if they come for counseling or whatever it is I say you know you you have to making a decision to change does nothing unless people know you made a decision to change so tonight we we have a book that we want to put in your hands for free and it's my new life in Christ tonight whether it's been whether whether you've been the one that said Jesus doesn't fit my life whether you've been the one that your faith has been shaken or maybe you've just been waiting too long tonight if you say I'm ready to give Jesus my all I'm ready to make that decision just throw your hand up real quick we have a book we want to put in your hand some hands right here I'm telling you right now people say all the time young people listen to me young people in the room there's this lie in in your school that that says it's this rite of passage oh everybody does this the only time I've lived life with regrets is when I didn't live for Jesus you're not missing anything other than regret Jesus you can have my all so tonight right where we are let's just lift our hands up in this place we say Jesus you can have it all you can have it all go ahead Candace we're gonna they're, they're gonna lead us in the song tonight oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name forever for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord oh Lord our God sing it again oh praise Tonight we're making decision. We're not going to wait anymore. I'm telling you, living for Jesus is the best thing I ever did. A life free of fear and anxiety and just worry and confusion and a life of purpose. 
And I want to encourage you tonight. If my prayer team would come up as we are ready to leave. But, you know, I always tell the students, don't leave this place the same way you came. That's just dumb. If you need prayer for anything, whether it be work-related, health-related, whatever it is, you need prayer for anything. Our prayer team is up here. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you made a decision tonight and you say, you know what? I just need to tell somebody I made a decision tonight that my shelf is now empty. <laughs> my shelf is empty. If you didn't get a book and you wanted one, just throw your hand up real quick. Our ushers, will, will we're still here to get you one. We're going to sing this one more time. And if you need prayer for anything, come on up. Don't leave this place. And let's just praise the one who is alive. Because we're no longer looking among the dead. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you that Jesus is alive. He's alive. Father, I pray for those that maybe weren't ready to empty their shelf. Father, your word says that your word is powerful and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing through the, the, the soul and spirit and bone and marrow. And Father, I just pray, Lord God, that, that your word would stay with them. Father, I thank you that you are calling us out of darkness.
Father, I thank you for the lives that are changed today. Those that said, I'm making a decision. I'm not waiting any longer. Father, your word says that if we draw near to you, you draw near to us. That if we seek, we will find and the doors will be opened. So, Father, I pray for open doors for those that are seeking you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Do you want to share something real quick before we go? No? All right. Well, we're glad you, <laughs> you're glad, we're glad you guys are here tonight. We love you. Like I said, if you made a decision tonight, make sure you tell somebody. And if you needed a book and you didn't raise your hand and get one, our ushers are in the back. They would love to give you a book. And so you guys have a blessed weekend. And don't forget, he's alive. <laughs>